Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Just over 4,300 Albertans are still out of their homes as wildfires continue to rage in the northern part of the province. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is asking Canadians to donate to charities to help support those who've lost so much during this wildfire season. And Lethbridge police were called to a high-risk incident earlier today on the city's north side. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Evacuation orders remain in effect for many communities in northern Alberta, including Fort Chippewan and parts of Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation. In total, just over 4,300 Albertans are still away from their homes. Now, fortunately, there's been some much-needed rain up north, which has been helping the firefighters battle the 64 active wildfires. 18 are classified as out of control, 20 are being held, and 26 are under control. There are around 2,800 personnel battling the blazes, including recent reinforcements from South Africa. Meanwhile, in Nova Scotia, government officials there are offering residents forced out of their homes by forest fires free well water testing kits as thousands are allowed to return home. Tests are necessary because the groundwater may be contaminated by residue from the fire, chemical fire retardants, and fuel from ruptured tanks. The Barrington Lake wildfire is the only fire in the province that is still out of control, but it is not growing. The Roseway Hospital in nearby Shelburne was expected to reopen today. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is asking Canadians to donate to help support those who've lost so much during this devastating wildfire season. Uh, I also want to encourage everyone to donate uh, to the wildfire appeals. We've set up matching funds in uh, Alberta, in, uh, in, uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, and, uh, and in Northwest Territories. Uh, people can support uh, their neighbours who are uh, facing incredibly devastating losses all across the country. Uh, je, I also want to highlight that uh, Minister Blair uh, has kept the opposition leaders apprised. Uh, there was another briefing for opposition leaders last night. Uh, everyone is completely aligned and working together and trying to keep Canadians safe across the country. Staff from the Insurance Bureau of Canada provided some wildfire safety and prevention tips for homeowners who might live near areas that are susceptible to wildfires. The best thing we can all do is really make sure that we're paying attention to the fire danger rating. Uh, and checking you know, our local government or provincial government websites to understand any kind of alerts uh, or evacuation orders we may face. Over the longer term, really important to have a family plan of what to do if you are evacuated due to a wildfire, making sure you have a plan in place for you and your family to be out of your home uh, for at least three days, if not longer. When we think about our property, lots of things we can do to make sure that's well maintained. Uh, make sure you know we're not including any dry yard trimmings up near our homes, uh, where you know they could become quite combustible. Uh, same thing for our gutters, and also just making sure that any trees or shrubs that we have around our properties are well maintained, well groomed, uh, and aren't giving any kind of opportunity for sparks uh, or other ignition materials to get in there uh, and then create a real challenge for our for our home itself. According to the Insurance Bureau of Canada, 2022 was the third worst year in terms of insured damage across our country due to severe weather events. Officials say they're seeing claims totaling close to $2 billion now. Well, we had some light showers in parts of southwestern Alberta today. Jeanette Roche is now with an early look at the forecast. Jeanette, the rain clouds which paid us a visit earlier, we're only here for the short term. Yeah, over the next couple of days, we will be back into some warm, sunny conditions, Hal. Looking at a high of 28 degrees on Wednesday. Now, couple that with a humid X of 29 and a UV index of 9, which is very high. So put on that sunscreen for sure. And those showers, they're not done with us quite yet because over the next week, we're going to be seeing them intermittently, particularly in the evenings. And I will be back later in the show to give you all those details. Hal? Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. One man was taken into custody following a critical incident involving Lethbridge Police on Tuesday. At around 8 o'clock in the morning, police were called to a home on the 1900 block of 13th Street North to try and execute some arrest warrants to a known suspect. The K-9 unit and tactical team were called in after attempts to get the man to come out were unsuccessful. Police used tear gas to flush the individual out of the home. He was then taken into custody and charges are pending. Political leaders of all stripes were shocked and outraged by the decision of federal corrections to move convicted killer Paul Bernardo from his maximum security prison in Ontario to a medium security facility in Quebec. 
You can include Public Safety Minister Marco Menachino in that group. I remember when he was charged. I remember the course of those trials. Uh, I remember when he was convicted and when the courts assured uh, Canadians that he would serve out his days uh, in a maximum security institution under the most strenuous conditions, given how horrific uh, the crimes were that he perpetrated on women and young girls. Um, as a result of that, I took uh, the opportunity this morning to speak with Commissioner Kelly. Uh, I told her that as a former federal prosecutor and as a Canadi Canadian uh, that I was profoundly uh, concerned and again shocked by this decision. Um, she assured me that she understood. Uh, she also assured me that uh, she was going to be reviewing the matter. And in the meantime, our thoughts do turn to the families of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. Uh, I have to assure them uh, that we obviously, uh, our hearts go out to them and we are concerned for them and we'll continue to make sure that these decisions are taken with victims at the centre of our approach as well as uh, public safety as the paramount objective. Ontario Conservative MP Colin Carey discussed his private member's bill aimed at improving transparency and disclosure of information of victims of violent crime. Carey says Bill C-320 has two main purposes. One, amending current Canadian legislation to better meet the needs of victims of crime by providing timely and accurate information upon sentencing of an offender and avoiding the false comfort of misleading parole eligibility dates. And two, ensuring that victims of crime are provided with improved transparency and passage of information from the Correctional Services Canada and the Parole Board of Canada. Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev blasted the Trudeau government on their economic record. Polyev says it was just six months ago that Finance Minister Christian Freeland promised a balanced budget by the year 2027. She said that in deficits fuel inflation. Right. Deficit Finance Minister John Manley, a Liberal, said that while the Bank of Canada is slamming on the brakes of inflation with higher rates, this government is slamming on the gas with higher spending. This could cause the whole engine to blow and all of that mortgage debt Canadians hold comes up to renewal unless the rates come down. So will she act now to put in place a plan to balance the budget to bring down inflation and interest rates. I am truly appalled by the reckless and irresponsible behaviour we are seeing from the Conservatives today. They are showing that they prefer adolescent partisan games over actually delivering support to Canadians. So let's talk about what they are preventing Canadians from getting with their parliamentary childishness. They are preventing Canadians from getting the doubling of the tradesperson's tool deduction. They are preventing us from putting in place an anti-flipping tax wow. that's going to stop speculation in homes. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, what is truly reckless is driving up inflation and interest rates on Canadian consumers who are the most indebted in the entire G7. In fact, the combined consumer debt is almost bigger than the entire Canadian economy. And when the monster mortgages that Canadians took out with the advice of this government back in 2021-22 come into higher rates for renewal, there could be a massive mortgage meltdown. Former Governor General David Johnston spent more than three hours on Tuesday being grilled by MPs about his decision not to recommend a public inquiry into allegations of foreign interference in Canadian elections. Political reporter Brian Lilly says not only has Johnston said no, but MPs have voted yes, and it is the will of the House of Commons to see a public inquiry take place. Not unless MPs decide that they're going to force one. Of course, they had the vote last week, and it was 174 in favour. 150 against. All three opposition parties, the majority of the House of Commons, the will of the House of Commons was David Johnston needs to step down and we need a public inquiry. David Johnston's response was, you know, you're welcome to your opinion, but no, it's not the opinion of the House of Commons, it, it's the will of the House of Commons. Brian Lilly will also have details of how the Canadian military was sent to Latvia without helmets. Apparently Canada can't afford them. He'll explain coming up in the second half of our program. The results are in from the recounts of two Calgary ridings. Elections Alberta says the NDP's Diana Batten has in fact defeated Tyler Shandro in Calgary, Acadia. 
and the NDP's Najwan Aljunaid, meanwhile unseated the UCP's Whitney Isik in the Calgary Glenmore riding. Chandra lost by just seven votes, while Isik lost by 30 votes. The UCP formed a slim majority, taking 49 seats compared with the NDP's 38. An event was held in Lethbridge College on Tuesday to highlight the low German-speaking Mennonite community here in our region. According to organizers, there are around 40,000 Mennonites here in southern Alberta. Amanda Sawatsky, one of the keynote speakers at the event, explained a little bit about who Mennonites are along with some of their belief system. The belief system is very um, conservative and traditional. It is a faith-based group, although some sociologists and historians will debate that. Maybe an ethno group or an ethno-religious cultural group. We can't decide yet. We speak low German um, and like I said, it's a faith-based, very traditional conservative values um, and you know, conservative dress. Now, the caveat to that is you can't make assumptions and so from me, you would infer that I'm from the low German population because I don't dress or look like somebody. So we need to be careful that we don't make assumptions. By the way, the Lethbridge Historical Society says way back in 1940, two Mennonite churches in Vauxhall, Alberta, were burned down due to anti-German sentiment during the Second World War. Foods can help heal. That's according to Alan Sabi of High Q Foods here in Lethbridge. Mr. Sabi shared with Bridge City News how a diabetes scare forced him to change his eating habits and now he says he's much healthier. Got tested for uh, type 2 diabetes and I said, what's type 2 diabetes? And the doctor said, it's high blood sugar. And I was like, well, let's just call it high blood sugar then. That's, you know, so then I didn't do anything about it for nine years because I'm a guy. And uh, then it got really, really bad. And when, and I won't tell you that whole story, but once it got really bad, I decided I better do something about it. And the doctor wanted to put me on medication. I said, just give me three months. And in three months with food alone, I completely reversed it and have been on this path of uh, shouting from the top of my lungs ever since. Make sure you catch the full interview with Alan Sabe from HiQ Foods and BCN's Jeanette Roche coming up after business news. You know, with the hot weather and schools closing for the summer, volunteers are needed now more than ever here in our city. The Lethbridge Soup Kitchen has been serving hot meals for those in need in our community for the past 36 years. The organization dishes out around 10,000 meals per month. Bill Ginther, the executive director of the Lethbridge Soup Kitchen, says they currently need volunteers to help prepare and serve the meals. We're very fortunate to have you know, a good core of volunteers. Uh, in total, we have about 750 uh, volunteers, which sounds like a lot, and thankfully they don't all come at the same time. Uh, we generally like to have 10 to 12 per shift. Uh, we're finding that during the summer months, that's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we find that our breakfast shift, which is early, uh, from 6 to 8.30, uh, we're, we're a little lean there. And so if people are interested in helping us there, it doesn't have to be a group, it can be one, uh, you know, one or two individuals or family members or companies that can, you know, just uh, come and bring in two or three or whatever to supplement what's already there. Ginther says total expenses for the nonprofit group is around $40,000 a month, which includes the food they purchase. And so far this month, they've received about $30,000. For more information about how you can support the Lethbridge Soup Kitchen, be sure to visit our website, bridgecitynews.ca. A new report says there is less and less religious freedom in the world. The study by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom supports the concerns raised and shared by UK-based Release International, which says that Christian persecution is on the rise, especially in Asia and Africa. Andrew Boyd from Release International has the details. A major new report highlights what it describes as worsening religious freedom around the world. The report by the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, USERF, echoes the concerns of UK-based Release International that persecution in Nigeria and India is getting worse, and both should be designated countries of particular concern. In Nigeria, USERF reports rampant violence and atrocities across Nigeria have continued to impact freedom of religion or belief, including militant Islamist violence. Release International welcomes the report, but urges USERF to further investigate the growing violence by Fulani militia. This is often targeted at Christian communities, while Nigerian armed forces are accused of standing by and refusing to intervene. India now, and since 2020, USERF has been calling for India to be designated a country of particular concern. It states religious freedom conditions continue to worsen. The Indian government promoted and enforced religious discriminatory policies, including laws 
targeting religious conversion. Use of say anti-conversion laws have now been passed in 12 states, and in some, marrying someone from another religion is also now illegal. Ramshan Saranu runs a law firm in Madhya Pradesh to help Christians who are being targeted. As he explained, the Voice of the Martyrs Canada. The, the recent amendments that happened in the anti-conversion law in Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh, there are the persecution number is very increased. And a lot of fanatic groups are using those points to file a cases against the Christians. For the last two years, it's very, very difficult situations for us, and not only for us, but for many other Christians in the state and in Uttar Pradesh as well. According to Yusuf, the growing restrictions in India are creating an increasing climate of intimidation and fear. Yusuf also highlights rising persecution in Eritrea and China, two other countries of particular concern to Release International. It's believed there are now more than 500 Christian prisoners of faith in Eritrea, and China has intensified its persecution of Protestant house church Christians. Well, it was on this day that the D-Day invasion took place during the Second World War. Israel invades Lebanon to drive out Yasser Arafat, and the first drive-in movie theater opens. This is Today in History for June the 6th. June 6, 1944. Allied forces storm the beaches of Normandy, France in the D-Day invasion of World War II. Commanding the massive operation, General Dwight Eisenhower, who tells the troops, You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. Years later, D-Day veteran Vernon Grosskup recalls what he saw on the beaches firsthand. The destruction and the death, the bodies laying all over. And it, uh, in other words, I've seen death before, but this was uh, uh, the ultimate, as I'd say. 1982, in the Mideast, Israel invades neighboring Lebanon to drive out Yasser Arafat and his Palestinian fighters. Months later, Arafat and the PLO leadership leave Lebanon, relocating to Tunisia in North Africa. Israel withdraws most of its troops three years later, but holds a border zone in South Lebanon until 2000. 1985, in Brazil, authorities exhume a body later identified as remains of Josef Mengele, the fugitive Nazi doctor. Known as the Angel of Death, Mengele performed cruel medical experiments on inmates at the Auschwitz concentration camp during the Holocaust. In 1933, the first drive-in movie theater opens in Camden, New Jersey. Drive-ins become a pop culture sensation across the United States in the first few decades after World War II. Today in History. June 6th, Camille Bohan and the Associated Press. Always loved the drive-in when I was a kid. Well, the record high temperature on this day was 32 degrees for Lethbridge, set way back in 1972. Sadly, we were nowhere near that, but the mercury will be climbing soon, however. Full weather details are coming up. Well, it was slightly cooler today in Lethbridge with some spotty showers. Jeanette Roche is in now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, weather-wise, it's kind of looking like a mixed bag this week. Some light showers, then lots of sunshine and hot once again. Yes, we're certainly seeing some hot sunny conditions mixed with those intermittent showers, particularly in the evening. So as we're looking into Wednesday and Thursday, mainly sunny skies, highs of 28 and 29, going to be warm, going to be humid, going to have high UV indexes. So definitely break out that sunscreen. And then we're going to see 60% chance of showers beginning Thursday night into Friday. Friday's high, 22 degrees. Uh, Friday's uh, night, if those showers continue. Into Saturday, though, we're looking at a mix of sun and cloud, a high of 25 degrees, a beautiful 26 expected on Sunday and then Sunday evening once again we're looking at showers which are going to continue into Monday with a high of 24 degrees but uh, we are definitely staying above the average high for this time of year as we're looking at the almanac there average high is 21 degrees average low 7 degrees 
our high temperature on this day happened back in 1972 and it was 32 degrees. That was a hot one. And it was a chilly one though back in 1951. That was the record low on this day was only zero. Sun rose this morning at 526. Sunset this evening is at 935 p.m. So we're now looking at 16 hours and nine minutes of daylight. Loving that. Mainly sunny skies on the west coast tomorrow looking at a high of 25 degrees in Victoria. Uh, the closer you are to the water though more like 20 degrees. 25 also in Vancouver but opposite effect closer to 30 as you move further inland. Lots of sunshine there. Sunny conditions also expected uh, across the rest of Alberta tomorrow looking at highs of 28 degrees in both Edmonton and Calgary tomorrow. Now there is a heat warning in effect across the rest of the prairies particularly in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Saskatoon though high of 27 mainly sunny skies Regina that's where that heat warning is in effect. Uh, same thing for Winnipeg we're looking at humidex values of 38 or higher over the next few days 30 for a high though in Regina chance of thunderstorms same thing for Winnipeg they're looking at that risk of thunderstorms tomorrow with showers and a high of 27 degrees along with all that humidity as we get into the central part of the country we're seeing uh, air quality statements for Toronto and Ottawa 22 for a high in Toronto uh, mainly sunny skies but that's mixed with some widespread smoke there same thing for Ottawa widespread smoke only 17 degrees and we're, we're seeing um, those the smoke from the forest fires in Ontario and Quebec that is wreaking havoc on that air quality there. Same thing in Montreal. Montreal is sitting under a smog warning and that also is due to that deteriorating air quality due to those uh, wildfires in Quebec and Ontario. 16 for a high there in Montreal with a 40% chance of showers. Showers also all across the Maritimes tomorrow looking at high of 11 degrees in Fredericton, 15 in Halifax, high of 14 in Charlottetown and more showers expected tomorrow in St. John's as well with a high of only 12 degrees. So there you have it. That is your forecast. 90% of 275 Canadian construction companies surveyed say they're dealing with a shortage of skilled labour or tradespeople. Many say they may need to turn to other options such as prefabrication or innovative new technology to get around the problem. But those who responded to the survey by KPMG also admit that Canada's construction industry has been very slow to adopt new digital technologies. It appears as though the housing market in Lethbridge is heating up. Courtney Atkinson is the CEO of the Atkinson team at EXP Realty here in our city. He says a number of Canadians are flocking to Alberta in search of affordable housing. We're seeing a lot of people move here from Ontario and BC. So you can go to uhaul.com actually and, and check this stat. And over the last four years, Alberta has been the number one destination for one-way U-Haul drop-offs in the entire country. And so if you look specifically at Calgary, Lethbridge and Medicine Hat, you're seeing a lot of folks relocate here. Why? Because it's still very affordable by Canadian standards. I mean, you can get a great house in Lethbridge or Medicine Hat for under $350,000. In Calgary, the average price is only about five fifty. dollars So compared to Toronto, where, you know, an average house price is over a million, you know, you're literally pocketing half a million dollars just by moving. And you can still keep your job, work virtually, and have a shorter commute to the grocery store or any of the amenities that you want to enjoy. So there's a lot of folks wanting to experience Alberta for many reasons. According to the Canadian Real Estate Association, the average price for a home in Lethbridge dropped 1.6% from just over 335000 in April of 2022 to just over $329,600 in April of this year. Merrick is suing the U.S. government over a plan to negotiate Medicare drug prices. The drug maker has called the program a sham that's equivalent to extortion and is seeking to stop it altogether. The program was laid out in the Inflation Reduction Act and is expected to save taxpayers billions of dollars in the future. Merrick says the program does not involve genuine negotiation, but instead says the government picks the drugs to be included and then dictates the price while threatening drug makers who decline to agree to a, quote, ruinous daily excise tax. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 123 points on the day to finish at 20,055. The Dow was up 10 points to 33,573. The S&P 500 was also up 10 on the day to 4,283. And the Nasdaq was up 46 points to 13,276. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 67 cents to 71.48 US per barrel. Natural gas was up two cents to 226 US. Gold was up two cents to 1963.54 US an ounce, and silver was even at 23.57 US an ounce. 
Feed wheat is at $11.21 per bushel, barley's at $8.97, canola's at $15.10, and corn is at $10.31 per bushel. Live cattle were up 268 to 179.83. Feeder cattle August contract was up 65 cents to 243.25, and lean hogs were up 298 to 88.30. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 74.60 U.S. Recapping one of our top stories, evacuation orders remain in effect for many communities in northern Alberta, including Fort Chippewan and parts of Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation. In total, just over 4,300 Albertans are still evacuated. Fortunately, there's been some much-needed rain up north, which has been helping the firefighters battle the 64 active wildfires. 18 are classified as out of control, 20 are being held, and 26 are under control. There are 2,800 personnel battling the blazes, including recent reinforcements from South Africa. Former Governor General David Johnston took the stand at the House of Commons. He was asked why he believes there should not be a public inquiry into foreign interference of our federal elections. Political reporter Brian Lilly will have details for us momentarily. Listen, if you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Here's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar. All are invited to the Community Job and Resource Fair on Thursday, June 8th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the YMCA of Lethbridge. Explore a variety of employment opportunities in various industries and connect with over 40 local employers and service providers. Get a head start on a new job by bringing your resume to showcase your skills. For more information, visit lethbridgejobfair.ca. Big Brothers, Big Sisters and Lethbridge is looking for volunteers to mentor children and youth in their various programs. Volunteers commit to one visit per week for one year. They have many kids that are looking for a big brother or sister. Make a difference in a child's life and start something big. To apply, visit lethbridge.bigbrothersbigsisters.ca and for more information, call 403-328-9355. And that's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar. Canada is burning. We're seeing wildfires not just here in Alberta, but across the country right now. Most recently in Quebec. There's been so much devastation, not just with the amount of homes lost, but also valuable farmland across the country. Now, there are calls coming from Ottawa for a national forest fire service. To chat about this in more detail is political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, who joins us once again from Toronto. Brian, what would a national forest fire service look like, and is this the direction we should be headed to as a country? I'm not sure that a national forest fire service is what we need, but I'd agree with the idea of greater uh, coordination, maybe an office to coordinate. Um, fighting forest fires is, you know, nobody cares about jurisdiction when you're in the middle of fighting a fire, but it is the responsibility of the respective provinces. And also the equipment needs to be on the ground in those respective provinces ready to go when fires happen. This year has been incredible, whether we're talking British Columbia, Alberta, um, not so much in Ontario yet, but uh, there are some. Uh, you know, you mentioned Quebec, just outside of Ottawa, there's forest fires burning. My colleague, Brian Passifume, who is on the, the Hill now, uh, he's, he's an old Alberta reporter. He says it looks like his days of covering Alberta forest fires in Ottawa, and you know that norm normally doesn't happen. So this is going on across the country. We're going to have a record year because of so many early fires. And, and so there's talk of, Shall we coordinate in some way? Now, I think there could be an argument made for the federal government having a few pieces of equipment that they can quickly deploy. But, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of sussing out what this would mean. Pierre Polyev, the conservative leader, has said he's not opposed to the idea of more coordination. He wants more detail of what people are proposing. Um, the, the Trudeau government hasn't said yes, but they, again, they're saying, let's think about it. If the idea is a dedicated fire service where you've got forest fires, full-time employed year round sitting waiting for a fire to start, that's not a good idea. If you're gonna say, all right, well, we need three or four water bombers that the federal government has in addition to the resources the respective provinces have, maybe that is a good idea. Maybe that's something that we can look to, as well as an office that once season kicks off, because we know it ebbs and flows, that there is a, a coordination of, all right, Alberta, you need an extra 200 bodies. We've got them here. 
let's help out that way. That might be something that could do. It, it organically happens already, but if there's a way to make it better, I think everybody would be on side with that. Yeah, Alberta just brought in another 200 firefighters from South Africa. It's pretty incredible, the help that we're receiving from all over the world right now. Brian, former Governor General David Johnston appeared before the Procedure and House Affairs Committee of the House of Commons. He was asked about his potential conflict of interest in relation to being hired as a special rapporteur looking into foreign interference. What did he have to say? It was remarkable to watch um, Conservative MPs uh, Larry Brock, followed by um, uh, Michael Barrett, were questioning him about his relationship. And Larry Brock walked him through all the quotes that both David Johnston and Justin Trudeau had made over the years, interviews, multiple, in 2010, in 2016, in 2017, statements the two of them had made about how close they were. And, and then just last week, John, or a week or two ago now, I guess, Johnston saying, well, you know, this so-called friendship. Uh, well, Brock was asking, when were you telling Canadians the truth? On May 23rd of this year, or was it in 2010, 2016, 2017? And, and Johnston tried, he was very political in his entire appearance before the committee, uh, tried to downplay this relationship again that he'd played up for so many years. And then I, I believe it was Michael Barrett was asking him about the fact that he hired uh, retired Supreme Court Justice Frank Iacobucci to offer an opinion on whether Johnston was in a conflict of interest. And Barrett said, isn't it true that you and Iacobucci are lifelong friends? And, and I knew they'd been friends for a while. I didn't realize how long, how. They've been friends. Johnson's 81 years old now. They've been friends since he said about the age of 25 when they were both young law professors at the University of Toronto. That's more than 60 years or, or close to 60, sorry, close to 60 years of friendship. And, and that's the guy you turn to to say, am I too close to this other guy to do the job? That's way too cozy. And then NDP uh, leader Jagmeet Singh showed up and was quizzing him about the fact that he hired a, a lead counsel. Um, who is a major liberal donor. So it was all far too cozy in what was a very political appearance from a guy who's supposed to be above politics. And Johnston says we don't need a public inquiry, yet the NDP are calling for one. Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives say we need a public inquiry. Will we actually see one into foreign interference, Brian? Not unless MPs decide that they're going to force one. Of course, they had the vote last week, and it was 174 in favour. 150 against. All three opposition parties, the majority of the House of Commons, the will of the House of Commons was David Johnston needs to step down and we need a public inquiry. David Johnston's response was, you know, you're welcome to your opinion, but no, it's not the opinion of the House of Commons. It, it's the will of the House of Commons. So the government has basically rejected the will of the House of Commons. It's up to the opposition parties to say, we're going to force you to it. Jagmeet Singh has the best hand to play. He's got the confidence and supply agreement or the coalition agreement. He can say to Justin Trudeau, you either call a, a, an inquiry or this agreement is off. That doesn't force us into an election. How? That just makes the government look for a new dance partner for every piece of legislation they want to pass. It makes the government's life more difficult. They could say, we're going to grind the work of committees and the legislature to a halt until we get a public inquiry. There are a number of steps that they could take. So far, Jagmeet Singh is not showing any interest in that. He has said that he will not call force an election over this. That's the last resort, but he's already said he's not willing to go to that last resort. You've just taken your biggest threat off the table, and that tells the government you're not going to be serious. So Justin Trudeau is going to try and ride this out not call an inquiry, which is what we need at this point, and, and try and hope people forget about Chinese election interference that helped his party while the House is gone over the summer. Brian, some people believe that Jagmeet Singh will not pull the plug on the coalition until 2025, until he gets his full pension. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I've heard that and I've done the math calculation. He would have to go to February 2025 for his pension to be vested. Uh, Look, there was a time when MPs' pensions were gold-plated. Uh, for every dollar they put in, we, the taxpayers, put in four or five. It's not that way anymore. It's 50-50, like a lot of pension plans. Now, it's better than the RRSP matching plan that uh, some people have, but it's not what it was, and it's not like he would be getting $100,000 a year. 
he makes well over 100,000, maybe 180, $190,000 a year now, he would be uh, getting a pension and he wouldn't be eligible for it till he's 55. That's years from now. Um, it might be in, you know, after only six years, 20, $25,000 a year that he can get 15 years down the road. I, I don't think that's the main factor. The NDP is weak now. The NDP is not in a good position. Of course, the latest Leger poll for National Post and Post Media showed none of the parties are in a good position. They're all basically where they were. They've all got their regional strongholds. Um, but nationally, they are pretty close to where we ended the last election. Brian, a shocking story came out related to the Canadian military. Apparently, we cannot afford helmets for soldiers stationed in Latvia. How does this happen? Bad planning, uh, bad management, bad procurement, uh, incompetence by the federal government, that all of the above. Look, I, I can understand if it was the olive drab boxer shorts that they gave me uh, when I signed up for basic training all those years ago. Oh, well, there's a um, you know, supply chain problem. You can't get your green boxers or your green Y fronts uh, to go with your green camo. But sending people into... Uh, an active operation like Latvia and then saying, but we don't have helmets for you, it, that's unthinkable. It, it, it's not, we're not sending them to Latvia for um, a, a, a bit of a tourism trip. They're not going over to um, look at the local scenery. They're there because there is a fear in NATO that Russia will try and overrun the Baltic states. It, that fear has been there for a long time, even before the, the latest invasion of Ukraine. That, that's why that operation is there, because Latvia is a NATO member. So we, we know that there is potential for something to happen. And we're asking our soldiers to do without basic equipment. This is shameful on the government. And you know they want to quibble over Pierre Polyev's choice of words when he says it feels like everything's broken. Well, the military is definitely broken. They can't provide basic equipment to soldiers that they want to send into harm's way. Speaking of Tory leader Pierre Polyev, Brian, he said that he will block the Trudeau budget from being passed. So two questions for you. Why is he doing it? And what is his end game? Uh, he's doing it not for the reasons I described earlier to try and force a public inquiry. Uh, he gave a very clear answer to this uh, the other day when he announced that he would put forward as many as 900 amendments to the budget, that they're going to slow down committee, they're going to force votes on different issues. Uh, th that's how he's going to try and slow down the budget being passed. It will eventually be passed, and the government will be able to force closure, force an, an end to debate, and force a vote on this at some point. Uh, but he's going to make them sweat it for a while. And the reason is uh, they're overspending. Uh, it, as he put it in uh, quoting former Liberal Finance Minister John Manley, the Bank of Canada is trying to hit the brakes on inflation by raising interest rates. Meanwhile, the federal treasury is trying to hit the gas by doing more stimulus spending. Christia Freeland's budget that they're trying to get passed right now has a lot of stimulus spending in it. Stimulus spending that we don't need in the economy right now when we've got inflation the way that it's at. Yeah, it's come down from hitting almost 10%, but it's still way too high. We're, you know, there's a good chance we're going to see another Bank of Canada interest rate hike tomorrow. Uh, that hurts small businesses. That hurts families with lines of credit, with variable rate mortgages. These are things that are hurting Canadians in the economy. And, and part of what Polly have said is we've got to deal with the inflationary spending side now so that inflation is under control by 2025, 26, 27. There is a huge amount of mortgages that were signed several years ago when interest rates were really low and, and people leveraged themselves to buy bigger houses. Government kept saying inflation uh, or interest rates aren't going up. Those mortgages are going to come for renewal and people are going to find out that they may have two, three thousand dollars $3,000 more per month just in a mortgage payment. They're not going to be able to afford it. We're going to be in for a world of pain when it comes to uh, those mortgage settlements. Think of the economic pain that would cause straight across the country. It's, you know, If people start you know, defaulting on their mortgages, that becomes a cascading effect. He says we've got to deal with it now. The Trudeau liberals say you're just stopping people from getting the, the help they need. 
and, and you've got to pass the budget. They don't want to cut the spending. They don't even want to slow the growth of spending in, in the Trudeau government right now. Brian, my mortgage is coming up for renewal July 1st. I locked in four years ago at 2.79. And right now, just for a two-year close, I'm looking at at least 6%. It's unbelievable what's going on yeah. right now. And, and, and those things hurt people. They yeah, hurt absolutely. people. They hurt families. They hurt businesses. Yeah. And, and as I said, cascading effect. You've mm -hmm. got to decide, am I going to spend that much on my mortgage? Am I going to switch to something else? Am I going to sell? Yeah. Um, th these are the things that everyone has to think about. And you, you you end up with decisions that are going to hurt somebody. Yeah, I'm going to have to bite the bullet because I definitely want to keep our home here. So, Brian, this here TC is looking at banning Fox News here in Canada, and it appears as though they have quite a bit of support. But let me ask you, will it actually happen? I mean, I hope not. Um, we kept Russia Today on the airwaves for years, and that is actually a propaganda channel for the Kremlin. Um, you, you'll remember our Sun News days. It was easier to get Russia Today RT than it was to get Sun News from some cable and uh, satellite uh, services. Um, that was a bizarre scenario. But we believe in free speech in this country. Uh, Fox News, you can love them, you can hate them. They are a point of view, and I don't think they should be banned. By the way, if you want Fox News in Canada, you have to pay extra for it. So you're already being penalized because you got to pay extra money just to get it. Unlike, say, CNN, another American outlet that has its own political viewpoint. But I'll say this. It's all being driven by politics. And, yeah, you see the headlines that say thousands want this banned. I guarantee you that if I was able to get the CRTC to hold hearings on banning CBC, I could get thousands of people. I could get tens of thousands of people to say, yeah, get rid of them. I don't want them anymore, and I don't want to pay for them anymore. So it, it comes down to politics. It comes down to partisanship. This, this is not the type of, of situation we should have. But a complaint was made to the CRTC. They foolishly decided to go ahead with hearings. We'll see what they decide in, in a few months' time. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for joining us today from Toronto. Thank you, Hal. Well, food allergies and other issues seem to be on the rise these days. So we're gonna find out how to cook some healthy foods for people with food allergies and all kinds of issues. I'm here with Ellen Sabi of High Q Foods. We're actually inside the Purple Carrot. Alan, thanks so much for letting us come in and invade your space today. No problem. Love it. You're going to teach us how to cook. First of all, tell me about High Q Foods. How did this get started? What's your backstory? Sure. Well, I was uh, type 2 diabetic, 250 pounds. I come from a kickboxing background. So I was, uh, you know, cutting weight, putting on weight, cutting weight, coaching guys. And when I stopped doing that, I just kept putting on weight. And turns out I was insulin resistant. That's in my genes. I was my whole life. Did, couldn't really understand what was wrong. Got tested for uh, type 2 diabetes. And I said, what's type 2 diabetes? And the doctor said, it's high blood sugar. And I was like, well, let's just call it high blood sugar then. That's, you know. So then I didn't do anything about it for nine years because I'm a guy. And uh, then it got really, really bad. And when, and I won't tell you that whole story, but once it got really bad, I decided I better do something about it. And the doctor wanted to put me on medication. I said, just give me three months. And in three months with food alone, I completely reversed it and have been on this path of uh, shouting from the top of my lungs ever since. Okay, and it's just all about the food. All about the food. Okay, so this kind of, where you were like, wow, light bulb going off yeah, in your yeah, head. Other yeah. people need to know about this. Yeah. Right? And being from like a fitness background, right? And, and having people cut weight and teach them how to do it. For me and my body type, it was completely wrong. And to be able to learn how food is just that medicine and what, it, you know, and all the issues that we face with our food manufacturing and what, what was in the stores, to eliminate all that and live like I have now for five years uh, with completely controllable blood sugars, down a bunch of weight, loving life, running in the coolies, right. and cooking my ass off. Okay, were you always a cook though, or is this- I've always loved to cook. Okay. I've always been the guy that goes to everybody else's house and cooks, but um, I have worked in a few commercial kitchens. I quit what I was doing, started working in some commercial kitchens, and just expanded into doing it myself, and just, it's always been a passion. So this isn't a restaurant, per se, but it's, it's more like people order food from you and you deliver? Correct, okay. there's two ways they can get food from me. You can order it online, or you can just show up in the coolies or the freezers and get food here. Okay, interesting. Okay, so these are, what are these exactly? These, these are steaks. steaks? These okay. are 10 ounce, 9 I and 10 ounce. That. Yeah, <laughs> I know, it looks like it. So those have come out of the sous vide machine. Okay. They've been in there for an hour and a half and they're a perfect medium rare right now. So we're just gonna get these pans smoking hot 
And what kind of steak is it? It's a top, uh, top sirloin. Top sirloin? Okay. So this is the kind of steak that you would normally get in a uh, steak sandwich. Go to a restaurant order a steak sandwich, yeah. so that's what you get, right? But they're, they're good steaks because they're, they're really low fat. They're really super lean, and once you do it like this, you'll think you're cutting into a, a prime rib. But, but when you get a pan that bounces, see how the water bounces around like that? I well, do. that means it's not going to stick. I could do an egg in there and flip it no problem now. So a little bit of oil. Don't put water in the pan after you put oil. You'll have a fire on your hands. And now, because these steaks are literally already cooked, what we're going to do is we're just going to reverse sear them. It's my favorite sound in the world. <laughs> The sizzling steak. Okay, so you mentioned, well, first of all, I have my apron on now yeah. so I can help you do some chopping up yeah. some onions and Turtles, whatnot. Uh, Want me onions. to stir these yeah. up? Okay, yeah. I did wash my hands as well. Okay. That's good. Okay, so Alan, you mentioned um, you have clients. I do. You yeah. have other programs. Yeah. Uh, what kind of programs do you have here? So if somebody can come and Almost like sure. a consultation? Right now, uh, we're in week uh, two of an online uh, program. There's 10 different ladies that are doing a, uh, well, I call it a wellness uh, fat ad adaptation program. And basically, teach them how to be low carb. Everybody's body needs to learn how to burn fat better, right? We've never done it because we eat so many carbohydrates. Right. But the way we evolved was to absolutely burn fat for fuel. Our body can only store a couple thousand calories of sugar, but if you would have seen me, obviously a ton of fat, right? Why? And the reason is, it's because that's energy. But unless, as long as we're eating carbohydrates, we can never access that energy. So as I teach people to, uh, great job. As I teach people to, uh, look at that nice sear. As I teach people to, uh, how their bodies can be fat adapted, and uh, that's cutting out carbs, but it's not for life, right? It's only a six week program, and then I teach people how to sustain that. And once people can sustain that, then you definitely can introduce, you know, high fiber and good carbs and yams and all kinds of beans and lentils and all kinds of things. But once we're fat adapted, it's shown that as long as we go back there a couple times a week, we can sustain that forever because we want to effectively burn fat for fuel. And we especially want to be able to have those ketones present when we need them, right? So it's always amazing because after four weeks, people are like, that's weird. We restrict the feeding window to six week, hours a day and they're not hungry. Why is that? Because we have calories. We have all the fuel we need. Exactly. Like go to the fridge, go get something body. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. So that's the premise of it. So would you say that no two people are the same in terms of how they, how they store their fat, how they yeah. give their metabolize everything? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, there's such a thing as bioindividuality, right? Like the, the, everybody's got, two arms, two legs, five fingers, but you know, everybody's got dysbiosis is a little bit different. I mean, women especially, I mean, they just get the short end of the stick. You, you guys are way more antibiotics as a rule than men. And you absolutely, that destroys your gut biome. So I make sauerkraut here, fresh sauerkraut, that's in the shelves. Uh, the bone broth has got, you know, very, very good stuff for your guts as well. But you know, if you're high blood sugar versus high cholesterol, or maybe you're uh, underactive thyroid, overactive thyroid, there's all little nuances there to what we can do. So it's not all exact, there's not a cookie cutter, but like 80% of it's the same. So is this basically the keto diet? Well, it is getting you to burn fat, right? So uh, it definitely is, but the keto diet can mean anything to anybody, right? I mean, you could just eat salami and be in ketosis. So the fact that you have ketones present means that you're in ketosis, and that's where the word keto diet comes from. But how you go about that in a healthy manner versus dirty keto and everything else, I don't like to use the word too much, but I do measure ketones. The nice lady that was just here, her ketones are up high, she just finished the workout, super happy, losing a lot of weight. Okay. Fat burns differently than sugar, definitely, in our energy pathways. And for one molecule of fat, we can get 54 units of energy, right. sugar's only 38. Okay and less oxidative stress and all kinds of advantages, which is why our body stores it and it doesn't store sugar. So it is getting you into ketosis. And then we want that fat adaptation to stay there with you with the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much science behind that. Lots of science, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But basically like the old school diet was eat less and do more. And we still have to be in a caloric deficit, but if we're in a caloric deficit adding sugar, then we've lowered the energy going into our machine, right? Okay, this, this looks like a fairly simple meal that um, that anybody can really cook. Yeah. It's nothing really outside of the norm, I and mean, we're talking steak and onions and veggies. Yeah. 
you're basically just cutting out the fats, you're cutting out the carbs, right? Well, the fats are, uh, you know, the fats come from, uh, I use the healthy oil in, uh, you know, extra virgin olive oil on the roasted veg. We definitely used, uh, you could use ghee as well, but I used an extra or regular olive oil to saute the onions yeah. and then a quick sear on, on the steak, okay. right? You mentioned bone broth. You, oh, yeah. do, you, do you cook a lot with broth? I do, and that's how I started. I started taking broth because I found out how good it was for us. And what bone broth is, is it's uh, grass-fed, grass-finished beef bones or pasture-raised chicken, and you cook that down with basically some veg for 16 hours. And that extracts and leaches a lot of healthy minerals out of the bones, out of the marrow. I mean, it's something that we survived on. 200 years ago, you'd be eating broth right now, right? That's what you would have. And so I use it in all my soups. And we'd all be real skinny. And you'd all be real skinny, <laughs> <Right>? exactly. <laughs> and there's a lot of advantages to bone broth because it's really high in collagen, which is in your intestines, something called hydrophilic, so it protects your intestinal wall, and, uh, and uh, gelatin. Gelatin, collagen, gelatin is hydrophilic, sorry, collagen, hair, skin, nails. That right? is amazing. Yeah, so it's really good for us along with all the nutrients and protein that's in it. And uh, if you do it right, it's super tasty. But that's all I use for soups and everything here is my own broth. Right. So a, a meal like this, or most of the meals that you make, yeah. well, what's what's the average type? Is this pretty much your average meal, or do you? No, care? this is special because it's Steak Tuesday, and you oh, came, okay. right? Okay. So, so I had to do something special. Make? Well, on the, online you'll see, and out in the coolers every day you'll see a Caesar salad where I make my own dressing here from scratch. And again, I'm a huge believer with my cooking classes and teaching people if you can just make it yourself from scratch, you're on a, on a you're not using inflammatory oils, you're you know you're controlling the ingredients you're going to be way better off. How do you know if it's an inflammatory oil versus well, not? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if you can squeeze it, if you can cold press it and oil comes out, it's a good oil. If not, like seed oil, you can go to the store and say vegetable oil and there's pictures of broccoli and carrot on it. Right. But you can't get oil out of broccoli and carrots. But yeah. Food Canada and the, and, the, and, the, and the States, they allow you to save vegetable oil when it's a seed oil. And that's a 15 step process with chemicals. And they got to put deodorants in there because it's rancid and then it's very high in what's called omega-6 to omega-3. It's not good oil, right? And so if studies you can have shown it, that. If you can squeeze it, you can eat it. Basically. So that's basically avocado oil and uh, extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil is cold pressed as well, which I use a lot. Okay, okay. So this is really good for, you were mentioning people with gluten, gluten problems, That's correct, yeah. Diabetes. That's correct. What if you have, say, IBS? Yeah, IBS, there's a lot, a lot of studies that are show that like sugar, and, and of course, um, uh, gluten, just your, it feeds bacteria in their gut that aren't probiotics, but they can still populate. They can still get, and they get nasty, right? Yeah. So IBS is also been shown to really help improve with sauerkraut. We want to balance that gut biome, right? And if with sauerkraut, we're trying to build up the good biome and starve the bad bacteria, right? And that good biome, that good gut biome, those good probiotics, in order for biotic to turn pro, I always say, it has to be able to generate hormones, it has to be able to all regulate your autoimmune system, has to do all these things. And the sugar and people with SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, they don't, they don't have, it's a very, it's a huge dysbiosis, it's a huge imbalance. So eating like this is really, really important along with a good probiotic schedule, a schedule, a prebiotic schedule. Okay, so um, you were gonna show me something Maybe chopping an onion. That's right. We're going to get you to chop an onion. I do cooking classes. And my huge belief is not only do we talk nutrition for three hours and maybe have a little wine. Nothing wrong with that. Oh, that's fine. Wine's okay. Red wine's okay, people. Of course. <laughs> but what I want, because I'm a firm believer in if you just make a, a change to making everything yourself, that's a huge jump because then you're controlling the ingredients. So I teach people how to hold a knife. Um, and how to chop onions, how to chop a bell pepper. So I'm gonna chop an onion. Okay. I'm gonna show you how to chop an onion, okay. then we're gonna get you to chop an okay, onion. Okay, we'll see okay. if I can live up to the standard right. here. So we got a root and we got a stem. So we cut the stem off, right? And then I leave the root on and I cut it in half. Okay, now you might wanna just pause while I just take this off, take the skin off. Now the reason I leave the root on is twofold. One, it holds it together, right? And two, a lot of that stuff that makes you cry when the root is cut, that's what the releases. I was just going to ask you, Alan, do you sulfurs. have a special trick for not crying? It's to leave the root on. So leave, the, leave just one root on. And then when you hold your knife, get a good shot of that. We want to hold it with those three fingers, not on top, but we want to pinch it like a golf club. But we want to pinch it. So if I take those fingers off, I'm holding the knife. It's like choking up on a bat. I've got a good solid control of that knife now, right? And then we don't want to cut all the way through. We just want to use our fingers as a guide. 
cut it and then strokes this way. Flip it down, you're having onion, you're making. Very If cool. you can cut an onion that fast without chopping a finger off, you're gonna be like, who cares? Okay. So now we wanna cut, we don't wanna cut all the way down to the so, root. We just wanna You know cut. what, I'm I'm actually left-handed. Okay, go. So right. does this mess That's everything up? No, it doesn't. No, like that, see, right? you grab that perfectly okay. right off the bat. So now you wanna, nope, you wanna cut along the lines along of the lines. onion. Okay, but, but not you don't all wanna, the way. But you don't wanna cut all the way to the, all the way through. Right. So you wanna use your fingers as a guide. Like here? Look at me, you put it like this and you rock it forward so that your, your knife never goes Oh, past my finger? Past your finger. So you want to grab it like this. Yeah. Look at this. We're chopping there 101. We and now. And then I you, no, same thing. Like, get your little perfect little fingernails out of the way. So you want to hold it. You want to hold it like this, right? There, and then rock it forward. And then the blade comes up. Put the blade against my fingers. Put the, put the, yeah, and go down. There you go. And then I move this back, and it does it again. There you go. So that way you don't cut off those nails or your fingers. Oh no! I... See, and already that's <laughs> the really, nails are not really coming fast. off. Believe me. And when it comes too thin, you just rock that root down so it's got a good flat surface. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then that goes in the composter. Probably not as perfect. But no, but it's really good. Okay, so Alan, we're talking a lot about this. So, what is somebody's first step on their food healing journey, so to speak? Well, I think the, one of the two of the greatest things that you can do is cut out sugar and increase your probiotics, right? Really learn what also, really learn what an inflammatory oil is. Stay away from seed oils, really improve that. Cook from scratch as much as you can, that's more than one thing, but number one, I tell everybody, if you have any kind of a, a you know, weight issue or allergy issues, let's cut out sugar, number one. Oh, it's so Introduce, hard to do that though. I know, and if you, and I always say hunger is one thing, but craving's another. We really shouldn't crave anything, right? Being hunger is normal, who cares? Craving something? Eh, something's wrong. Well, Ella, thank you so much. Uh, before I grab another great big piece of steak here, I just want to say thank you so much for having us down here, teaching me how to cook these delicious, nutritious meals. Hopefully, I, I know I've learned something definitely. Hopefully, our viewers have as well. This is Alan Sabi of High Q Foods. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. Come and see us. The uh, kitchen is inside the purple carrot. Most people don't know. Thanks for coming down.